Bible that whenever Jesus rose from the grave, several of the saints also rose with him. Right. That they went from town to town preaching that Jesus is Lord. It's very quick, <clears throat> kind of scrubbed over. This is the that is the weirdest passage in uh, scripture, and nobody d talks about it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amateur Andrew. Welcome back to When the Goons, the Lost Books, the Bible. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was reviewing this video. We got like. 33 minutes into it and uh, it's about books that didn't make it into the bible canon and why they didn't make it into the bible canon and uh, last week was a bit of a doozy <laughs> not last week last video um the infancy of christ or what it was it called uh whatever this one was that one uh is in my nightmares <laughs> uh but anyway i'm here for part two because i'm curious to see what the other books have to say and also big thanks to everyone who watched the video and commented and liked the video uh, and especially to all the Wendigo fans who came over and showed some support really appreciate that and so um, I'm gonna do some more reviewing today so I'm curious to see what happens next this on its own because the second gospel of the infancy of Jesus Christ is right behind oh it. good the second, the gospel second of the infancy. there's a second one. Oh no <laughs> I remember the first gospel being with like, what was it? There were aliens. No, it was a guy was trying to have sweet time with his wife and then saw baby Jesus to have sweet time. And then I don't, there was a mule or something like it was, it, it was something else. I don't know. I feel like I've tried to block it out of my memory, but there's also just like vague images I remember from that. <laughs> of Jesus Christ, also known as Thomas's Gospel of the Infancy of Jesus Christ. Oh, no. Seems to follow right in line after the first one. Oh, oh, no. Oh, and Only they, wait, no. They decided that the author was Thomas instead of Caiaphas this time for some reason. People weren't buying the whole Caiaphas thing, so they decided to switch back to the Apostle Meta, which I guess worked in the past. It's also believed by some historians that Thomas's gospel was written first, so maybe this was the original account that was found and someone filled in the first gospel later, but who knows. So this one picks up where the first one... And like I said in the last one, it felt very intentional to be blasphemous, so I don't know the fact that there are two. I don't know. It's just, it's a lot of work for blasphemy. <laughs> I don't know. And the, yeah, I don't know. Trying to attach yourself to like a disciple or an apostle to get credibility or whatever. That's still, I don't know. It's one of those things where, again, you value human beings so much. I'm, let me try to make this make sense. You try to use a public figure name to make your message more legitimate, but what should matter in your message is the actual message. And so I feel like when you hear these, like, oh, it's like, oh, the Th Thomas's gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, oh, what did Thomas have to say? And it's just like complete Looney Tunes, which I'm assuming is about to happen. And, but there's other people who be like, oh, well, Thomas said this, so we should believe it. It's like, you got to fact check things. I think that's the moral of what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of this out here. There's a lot of crazy stuff. And a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, this is the gospel of Peter, or this is the gospel of James, or... They'll try to attach some like public figure pastor or some pastor will say, you know, he understands Greek or Hebrew better than other people. So this is what this passage says. But you have to really know, listen to what the actual message is. And what somebody once told me when studying the Bible is context is so important. Even if the word isn't exactly translated correctly, it doesn't change the context. So there's just so much false teaching out there, false teachings out there. If you don't really um, guard your heart, like the Bible says, that it's it's so easy to get led astray. I'll stop talking now. Okay. One left off <laughs> and opens, like I mentioned, with Jesus killing children. Oh. It says that when Jesus was a young boy. Forgot about that part. With the other schoolyard boys. And one of them ran into him and knocked him down. So Jesus stood up and said, you're dead. And the guy just fell over dead. And then whenever the parents complained <laughs> what? that their child had been murdered <laughs> jesus showed up and blinded them there's also a part <laughs> mentioned where jesus in the this sounds more like anakin skywalker than jesus christ like it's just <laughs> sounds like jesus christ it's like anakin skywalker's villain story it's like 
<laughs> Kids are playing on the roof of someone's house. And one of the boys falls off the roof and dies. Oh. So whenever the parents, like all death. the parents are around, and they're like, who killed this boy? And the other kids are like, oh, Jesus did it. So Jesus is like, no, I didn't. Watch. And he touches the dead boy. <laughs> and the dead boy comes back to life and is like, Jesus didn't push me. <laughs> it, makes, it makes him out to be an incredibly spoiled brat. Like, there's <laughs> other miracles also mentioned here where it says that Jesus made, like, a mold of clay into birds and then he just made the birds appear and fly off and he's also just a brat in general there's one it, it's again it's like uh trying to fill in the gaps i said this in the last video too so i'm sure i'll reiterate things if you didn't see the first video <laughs> but if the bible left something blank it's probably because it needed to be blank like jesus childhood was probably pretty boring so, like, people always are trying to add, like, oh, well, he probably did what these miracles. There's so many miracles we didn't know he did. But, again, when you look at context of Scripture, Jesus doesn't really perform miracles till he's his ministry starts. Because, again, when he's in Nazareth and he proclaims himself as the Messiah, and everyone's like, what do you mean? What do you mean you're the Messiah? We, we knew you. You're just you're the son of Mary and Joseph. So it's... It's very risky. It's another thing, too, you have to be careful with, because there's always, inter like, even I mentioned The Chosen last show, or not the last show, last part. I mentioned The Chosen show in the last video that, you know, it's a show about the disciples' lives and what that was probably like, but you have to be careful that you have to remember that's fiction. I mean, it's pro it might be true, but it's an interpretation of what it might be. So... You have to take it with a grain of salt. It's good. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but you have to be careful. And because there's Looney Tune stuff like this out there. One part where a teacher tries to teach him like the alphabet, and Jesus is like, I already know that. Why don't you tell me something I don't know, <laughs> idiot? <laughs> the book just ends with a message like, and then this child would one day die for the sins of humanity. So, now that we got that out of the way... Yep, that's that's blasphemy. Um, yeah, that's not even... Like he said, it's a bratty Jesus, but it's not a perfect Jesus. It's not the Lamb of God Jesus. Like, the Jesus they talked about in that gospel, gospel is just a brat. Like, like, I mean, that's not someone who could die for the sins of the world because that's kind of like they're being a sinner. <laughs> I mean, oh, you don't need to teach me the alphabet, alphabet. I already know that. It's like, nah, I don't think, I'm fairly, very, very, very confident Jesus never would say something like that. Because Jesus is always about humility. So, for him to be like, for them to like claim, oh, Jesus said, this this teacher that he knows the alphabet i'm willing to bet that i mean yes jesus does know the alphabet but in that situation if that situation were to occur jesus probably just listened because he was humble <laughs> and he wasn't a spoiled brat so that's my Let's thoughts move on to something else <laughs> let's Good. do we've been keeping it semi-chronological so let's go to the passion there okay the Passion narratives relate to Jesus' crucifixion and the events that surrounded it. In the Bible, the Passion is depicted through the canonical Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Here, Correct. a lot of the ones I've chosen not only relate to the Passion, but give a heavy emphasis on Pontius Pilate, the oh, Roman good. governor who sentenced Jesus to death. Oh, there is good. a ton of debate around Pontius <laughs> Pilate, because if you read the story, there is heavy speculation over if Pontius Pilate is to be blamed for Jesus' death or not. Because while the people are the ones who demanded that Jesus be killed, Pilate washed his hands and said that he found no fault in him. It's a yes or no, from my perspective, or my opinion. It's, on one hand, it was the people that pushed him to do it. But on the other hand, he was kind of a ruler. And so he had the power to say no. But he found his life more valuable than Jesus's, so he didn't stand in the way. Like, he could have easily stood in the way. Like, if he was truly trying to be the hero in that story, he could have just gave his life for Jesus. Right? Like, but instead it's like, oh, I've done everything I can. Like, 
he flogs Jesus like, well, I did everything I could. I beat the snot out of this guy and people are still mad. So I guess I'll kill him now. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I, I think Pilate makes an attempt for a Gentile or a Roman ruler in that situation, not necessarily Gentile, but just a Roman ruler, especially like the controversial history that they had with the Jews for him to like kind of step in for Jesus and be like, um, this doesn't seem right. I mean, he does that part right, but he also doesn't go the whole way. So I feel like it's a yes. It's a partially yes. He does the right thing, but it's also kind of a, he took the easier road. Like he tried to do it, but then he saw that he was getting nowhere. And so he just gave up instead of still doing the right thing. Which is good for our sakes, because then Jesus did die for us, and then we can have salvation, and he did rise from the dead, so we can come to him and repent of our sins, and trust him as our Lord and Savior and have salvation forever. So it was, from an eternal standpoint, that's a good thing, and obviously God does what God ordained, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't think Pilate did the right thing. Although he still condemned him to death, so... People are split. To give you an idea of how split people are on Pilate, there are some groups that venerate him as a holy saint, oh. and some that consider him a demonic entity. And the first of the passion stories that we're going to look at deal with this very subject. The Gospel of Nicodemus, or the Acts of Pilate. The Gospel of good. Nicodemus and the Acts of Pilate are really each their own separate writing, but they were discovered together and are always logged in unison with each other. So... While they are written together up here, I'm going to treat them like two different accounts because as you're going to see, they are very different. So let's start with the Gospel of Nicodemus and answer the question, who is Nicodemus? Nicodemus was a famous figure mentioned in the biblical Gospels. He was a Pharisee who came to Jesus by night and asked him of his nature and what it meant to be saved. And because mm -hmm. Jesus' response to Nicodemus serves as the foundation for a lot of belief regarding salvation, Nicodemus himself has been immortalized as one of the most important characters in the Gospels. Now, most people only know Nicodemus from this story. It's mentioned that he followed Jesus, but he's not specifically brought up throughout the rest of the Bible, except for one occasion. In John 19.39, shortly after the death of Jesus, it says... It's uh, also, not to interrupt, but it's also where we get John 3.16. I believe it's when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, right? I'm not just making this up. Let me fact check this. This, is, this sounds right, but it's one in the morning, so I am a pastor. <laughs> I know things. Yes, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus, Rabbi. Okay, yeah. And then he talks to him, and then he asks him, what do you mean? How can an old... Because Jesus tells him he has to be born again, and then this is where we get John three sixteen for God so loved the world. So that's where that comes from. It's also, again, for a religious leader that he had to go in the dark. That he couldn't just publicly meet with Jesus because he would be ridiculed. So in order for him to have this conversation with Jesus, he had to be in the dead of night. And then, But Jesus didn't turn him away. He said, okay. But it's just that was how much the Pharisees hated him. Was that Nicodemus literally couldn't be spotted with Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. So Nicodemus not only talked to Jesus that night, but it seems that he followed him up until his death on the cross, and even cared for his body after Jesus died. So the Gospel of Nicodemus, which most historians date to around the 4th century, seems to be a compilation of passion accounts from Nicodemus' point of view. And while you may be thinking that doesn't make any sense, did uh, my memory could be wrong. Did the God, the not the God, did the chosen portray Nicodemus not following Jesus? I'm trying to remember. I feel like he's. I could. It felt like they said he didn't. And that was one part where I was a little confused because it does seem like he converts. I don't know, that's kind of like a mystery. Like, I, he has that conversation, then you don't see him till the end, like he says. So, I mean, again, that's 
like I said, God leaves it intentionally blank. So we don't know. Maybe he followed Jesus immediately after that conversation, or maybe he literally didn't. Like Jesus' own brothers, so he didn't follow Jesus till he was crucified. Who knows? Sense. If Nicodemus was there when Jesus died in the first century, how could he be the writer of it in the fourth century? And it seems <laughs> that the Gospel of Nicodemus is a compilation of a lot of the oral stories that were passed down by people like Nicodemus and the heads of the early church. So it's more so using Nicodemus as a focal point to talk about a lot of the stories surrounding the crucifixion. Now, if you're familiar with the biblical account, most of this won't be anything new. Things like Jesus being brought before Pilate, Jesus asking what is truth, Pilate's wife saying that she had a dream about him. But there are some new details mentioned. Like for one, it says that Pilate, whenever he called for Jesus to be brought into the courtroom, sent out a messenger to get him. And when the messenger sees Jesus, he recognizes Jesus as the man who came into Jerusalem a few days before and was praised and honored by the crowd. So the messenger takes off his coat and lays it on the ground as a rug for Jesus to walk on. And whenever he's interrogated as to why he did it, he said it didn't seem right for this man to have to walk on the ground. After that, it quotes a lot of the book of Matthew and the book of John, giving us the narrative of the trial and Pilate's interrogation of Jesus. Sounds like fan fiction so far. Like it's not blasphemous, but it's fan fiction. Jesus. Now, the most out there part that the Gospel of Nicodemus adds to the story is it says whenever they were having the trial for Jesus, a bunch of the people who Jesus had healed on his ministry came to testify for him, including the man at the Pool of Bethesda, uh, the woman with the issue of blood, a few of the lepers, and other famous characters that Jesus healed throughout the Gospels. Now, while that's not, you know, like sacrilege or anything, I highly doubt all of them were in Jerusalem at that time. It also uh, yeah, it's a reimagining, but it's a pointless reimagining because there's just the real thing. <laughs> like I said, you either believe it or you don't. Like it's not. There's no point in being like adding details to make it sound cooler. Like it's what God did. Like it's the true story of what God did. So why try to add more things? Because like that just sounds. A little silly like oh everybody he healed just came and miraculously like tried to intervene for jesus but i mean Je i mean jesus own disciples saw everything like judas but even all the other disciples that didn't betray him they all saw the miracles and they didn't intervene no one stood up and said oh jesus did this he healed these people and they never did any of that because at the time the mob was formed and so everybody like ran so even if they were there Hypothetically, if all these people were in Jerusalem, there's a good chance that they felt intimidated, just like the disciples felt intimidated, that they wouldn't speak up about it. Also gets a detail of the crucifixion wrong. So in the biblical account, Pilate has Jesus whipped because he thinks that will satiate the people from wanting him dead, but then they still want him dead, so he orders him to be crucified. That was the reason that Jesus was whipped beforehand. Whereas in the Gospel of Nicodemus, it says that Pilate ordered for both at once. The crucifixion itself is pretty standard. Again, it uses a lot of the information from the other Gospels. And then the story talks about Joseph of Arimathea. This Joseph was a rich and influential figure within Jerusalem. And it turns out that he was a follower of Christ. So whenever Jesus was killed, Joseph went to Pilate and asked that he could have Jesus' body so that he could give him a proper burial. So Joseph takes the body of Jesus, places it in the tomb, and rolls a large stone over it. That's how, essentially, a homeless person like Jesus was able to be buried in such an elegant grave. So for doing this, and again, this is where the story diverges from the biblical canon, it says that Joseph was thrown in jail for burying the body of this heretic. Because the reason they had Jesus crucified is they believed him to be a blasphemer. This is actually something that a lot of the writings at the time talk about, like, not even the ones who claim to be a kind of gospel, just letters at the time say that Joseph was thrown in jail for burying the body of Jesus. We'll talk about that a bit more with a narrative later on this list, but the Gospel of Nicodemus kind of ends at this point that it's compiled several of the known-to-be-true narratives from the Bible, as well as oral history that was being passed around at the time of its writing. I am personally a fan of the Gospel of Nicodemus, and out of all the ones that are on here, I think it to be the most legitimate. Because, well, yeah, it had the mention of a bunch of people Jesus healed being there to testify against him. I'm sure maybe a couple were, 
and I don't think that the oral tradition of the time is good enough to be passed out as direct history, but there's little touches there, like Joseph being thrown in jail, or the messenger who was sent to grab Jesus rolling his coat out, that may be true, and I think add good context to the stories of the time. So it's for that reason I'm calling it historical. Now, uh, yeah, I mean, I understand where he's coming from on that one. Again, I feel like we're always in reverse. Because <laughs> anytime... Like, I felt like Gospel of James, you could have put in Blasphemy. You could have put Birth of Mary in fan fiction. And I would have put this one in fan fiction, but I understand what he's saying, because... I don't know. It's tough. I mean, it's kind of like on that thin line. It's just, you don't know, is my thing. You can't really prove that happened. Um, But that's just me. But, yeah. The second part <clears throat> of that Gospel, the Acts of Pilate. So a lot of you have probably heard of the book of Acts. It's the fifth book in the New Testament. But what a lot of you may not know is that there are a ton of books of Acts. The one we have in the Bible is the Acts of the Apostles, and it was written by Luke. So the Acts of the Apostles is just a telling of what the Apostles and Paul did after Christ's resurrection and ascension into heaven. But a lot of people saw the Acts of the Apostles and were like, so if I just say that what I'm describing is the Acts of these people, I can talk about the Acts of whoever I want. So there's ones like the Acts of Peter, the Acts of John, the Acts of Paul and Thecla, which we'll talk about later. And while a lot of them do have some legitimacy, for example, it's the Acts of John and Peter, I believe, that were written by apprentices who followed them in their ministry. So they're probably a pretty good account of what happened to them later in life. As a matter of fact, the Bible never mentions Peter's crucifixion, but if you're familiar with Christian history, then you probably have heard that Peter was crucified upside down. Right. This doesn't come from the Bible, it comes from the Acts of Peter. So while a lot of them have legitimacy, the Acts of the Apostles that's in the New Testament is the only one that was verifiably written by one of the Apostles. And again, think back to that whole list of eight I talked about earlier. And for an example of someone being a little quirky and silly with their Acts, look at the Acts of Pilate. Acts of Pilate is Dante's Inferno. Not literally, but reading it, it feels just like Dante's Inferno. There's a brief Going back to Acts, I don't know, it's interesting, because this is a random thought, and I don't want to let, just let the video play, because Wendigo deserves his own credit, so <laughs> I just want to steal his content. But uh, with Acts, it's interesting, because it kind of, like, it's the story of the church, and then, like, a lot of people make jokes, because then it becomes the story of Paul. But again, because Luke was a missionary with Paul, it makes sense, because that's, it's his own, like... Luke's kind of telling it from his own angle. It doesn't feel like it, but it is. It's what Luke saw himself, so or heard. So, I don't know, it's just interesting. Because the book of Acts was a really weird book to me for a long time. But then I've preached a sermon series on it, and it really kind of like opened my eyes to a lot of different things. Especially with Paul, because Paul just gets beaten up. <laughs> he just, man, he, that guy, I don't know. I like to think I'm tough, but I'm not Paul tough. Like, that is... I want to be Paul tough. I want to be that. I mean, everybody says, uh, you know, you would die for Christ, but you don't know it until you actually are faced with that situation. Like, everybody says, like, oh, I'll take a bullet for you, or blah, blah, blah. But until you're in that situation, it's just a hypothetical. So, in hypotheticals, you always sound a lot stronger. But then once you're actually faced with that situation, it's like... You can't run away from it. Like, that's when you really know. And Paul always faced death with, like, complete bravery and courage. It's like, because he wasn't worried about death, because he knew where he was going. Brief mention in the Bible that whenever Jesus rose from the grave, several of the saints also rose with him. Right. And that they went from town to town preaching that Jesus is Lord. It's very quick and kind of scrubbed over. This is the, that is the weirdest passage in uh, Scripture. And nobody talks about it. <laughs> when Jesus rises and the dead people rise, like that is single-handedly the strangest scripture that I think a lot of people struggle with because that feels like a huge deal. <laughs> like you read that, like he said, and it's just like right there. I mean, it's just the tiny section 
of scripture. It's like, yeah, no, um, people rose from the dead. I think it's only one in one gospel, too. And none of the other guys mentioned it, but for some reason, it's only in one. And it's just, I don't know. I didn't, even I don't really have an explanation for it. There's a lot of commentaries, but it's just like, it's just this random fact that really baffles me, too. Because, like, how do you preach that? Let me uh actually find it real quick, because it's interesting. Um, okay, it's in Matthew 27, 53. Whoa, hang on. Matthew 27, 53. Uh, then Jesus shouted, in verse, well, starting verse 50. Then Jesus shouted again, and he we released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the, in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. From top to bottom, the earth shook, rocks split apart, and the tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went to the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. A Roman officer and the other soldiers to crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that happened. They said this man truly was the son of God. And many women who had come from Galilee, Jesus, with Jesus to care for him, were watching from a distance. So then it's just like, there's this section, right? And then that's it. <laughs> it's just like, and so you're just reading this and then this happens and you're just like, what? And that's it. That's, that's all you get. It's like, exactly who? Like, was this people from that day? Was this, like, people's grandma and grandpa was coming back to life? Was this uh, David? Was this... I mean, if it was... I have to think if it was, uh, like, David, Moses, all, like, you know, people you read about in the Old Testament that you would know. Like, I feel like it would name them here if that was the case. So it feels like, to me, the people who were resurrected were probably... Uh, people they knew and they appeared to many people like I don't know it's it's very odd I believe it's only in Matthew and I think I had a theory once that maybe it was because if it was just people like from that era that you would kind of know I somewhat theorized that maybe the reason Matthew talks about this is because that Matthew saw someone he knew and that's why it's only referenced in Matthew is because it's that this is a personal story for him. Because again, the disciples all split, right? They all go different ways because the shepherd is hit and the sheep flee. So Jesus dies and all his disciples go. That was a terrible way to say it. But <laughs> so everyone's seen different things and then Matthew's given his account and then this is where he just mentions this very briefly and appeared to many people. So it makes it seem like Matthew saw this. I mean, obviously a lot of people had to have seen this, but Matthew particularly experienced this. Maybe he knew somebody, maybe his great, his grandpa came to life and was preaching. Like, I don't know, like, but it's such an odd section of scripture that I think again, we don't know, but I believe it happened. And so it's just interesting. Things you, uh, I can't wait to learn about in heaven. Anyway, back to the video. That's what the Acts of Pilate is about. So it is the resurrection of God from Pilate's point of view. So Pilate's in Jerusalem, and then they start hearing these reports that there's dead people walking everywhere. So Pilate goes out into the city, and he meets two men named Charinus and Lentheus who were people who had died years ago and were now resurrected. So Pilate asks what happened, and the acts of Pilate are the account of the two men. They describe hell as being this dark, empty landscape. It's very similar to the hell or shoal that's described in Judaism, or concepts like purgatory in Catholicism. And then the two men say that when they were down there, a giant light appeared at the gates of hell, and whoever this light was came up to the door and said that he needs to be let in. So Satan, apparently not knowing who this guy is, is like, sure, let him in. <laughs> no, no, it's Jesus. So then Jesus <laughs> grabs everyone and pulls them out of hell. Now, I'm not clowning on the concept. 
of Jesus going to hell after the crucifixion and raising the righteous out of perdition. That is a concept that's held in Catholicism. What I am clowning on is the dialogue the Acts of Pilate has while that's going on. For example, the whole part of... It, um, I think it... Does he... Doesn't it say he preaches to the dead somewhere? I'll have to look it up later. But I think it... Because it says he preaches to both the living and the dead. I think in first or second Peter. And then there's the whole thing like what happens when Jesus dies, right? Like where did he go? And my personal theory is that he went to paradise. Like I think it makes sense, right? Like he goes to paradise. Because at that time in Old Testament when you died I don't know, this is going really off and it's 1.40 a.m. my time so my head's not exactly clear but and uh, the story of Abraham and Lazarus is a good example of this because Lazarus the rich was a really rich or no, no no the rich man and Lazarus so Lazarus was a really poor guy and the rich man was really rich but Lazarus was sick the rich man was rich they both died the rich man goes to hell and then Lazarus goes and sits next to Abraham but Abraham's not in hell, but he's across from it because they couldn't go to heaven because Jesus hadn't died yet. And so there was like this area, I think that was called paradise. And so the rich man's in pain. He says to Abraham, like, go and tell my brothers and sisters or resurrect somebody from the dead to tell him I'm paraphrasing. This isn't the exact story, but you know, go tell them. And then Abraham tells them, well, if they didn't believe the prophets, uh, even if a dead man came to life, they wouldn't listen, which is true. Because, I mean, even this character Lazarus comes alive and the Pharisees' immediate re reaction when Jesus healed Lazarus was, we need to kill Lazarus again. <laughs> Jesus literally resurrects somebody and their only reaction was, we need to kill him. <laughs> it's just, I don't know, to have that heart of a heart is just unfathomable to me. But, um, but yeah, what happens... The somebody who dies in the Old Testament is like, pretty debated, I guess. I don't know if it's hotly debated, but it's fairly debated. Of the devil not knowing who Jesus is, which is not true. <laughs> and after they let him into the gates, there is a very long monologue where the devil's second in command, Beelzebub, is like, that man who you let in is so righteous. He's so perfect. <laughs> He's so full of love and glory. And the devil's just like, oh no, I'm an idiot. And then it cuts back to Beelzebub still being like, he's perfect, he's beautiful, I love him so much. Not the I love him so much part, but it's a very long insert of the demons talking about how great God is and Satan somehow not knowing that it was God coming to hell. And these two men, Chernus and Lentheus, were apparently next to every prominent figure of the Old Testament. Because in their account... They're like, yeah, and whenever Jesus came, the prophet Isaiah said this, and then King David said this, <laughs> and then Samuel said this, and it goes through, like, all the heavy hitters from the Old Testament. And it says that all of these... Another passage of scripture that really confuses me is, uh, with Samuel, because he just mentioned that, and I was thinking about it, is, uh, when Saul, before Saul dies, he goes and sees a medium who resurrects, or not resurrects, but brings Samuel's soul up from the grave, and... It's actually Samuel, which has always been puzzling to me. Like that whole story. I think it's in uh, First Samuel. Hang on. I'm going to see, test my Bible memory. Let me, it's in First Samuel, be towards the end. 30, this would be the last chapter. Mm. How do you work this contraption? 31, death of soul, no, it's right here, I know it, it's right there, those things reject David, um, uh, it's right here somewhere, it's right here, so yes, Saul consults the medium, a boom, first try baby, <laughs> uh, so he goes to this lady and he tells her to call her up, call up Samuel, bring him up here, bring him out of the bullpen. She says, 
She sees Samuel and she screams, You've deceived me, you're Saul. And then, blah, 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 don't be afraid of what you see. And then, like, this whole thing, it's real. This happens, so. But, I mean, it doesn't go well for Saul because Samuel basically comes up from the chest. It's like, uh, Why ask me since the Lord has left you and has become your enemy? The Lord has done just as he said he would. He has torn the kingdom from you and given it to your rival, David. And so, basically, he tells him, you're going to die now. Like, this is the end. <laughs> yeah, no, he says in verse 19, What's more, the Lord will hand you and the army of Israel over to the Philistines tomorrow, and you and your sons will be here with me. The Lord will bring you down the entire army of Israel in defeat. So he tells him, basically, you're dead. You are a goner now. But yeah, again, like, Samuel comes up. He's, he's not coming down from heaven. He's coming up from somewhere. I don't know. That was just interesting to me. Saints are brought to heaven and whenever they get to heaven, there's two people already there waiting on them. Enoch and Elijah. Now this is a really cool little inclusion in the story because Enoch and Elijah were the only two people in the Bible who never died. Both of them were directly brought up to heaven by God. So in this story, it's saying that while everyone else was essentially in heaven's waiting room waiting for Jesus to pull them into heaven, Enoch and Elijah were already there making room for everyone. So Jesus is like, all right, I got to get back to earth to do the whole resurrection thing. And it describes... That's true about Enoch and Elijah, because Abraham's down there. And I believe the story of Abraham, rich man, and the rich man, Lazarus. Because some people will read that and say, oh, it's a parable. But the thing about Jesus' parable is, are, is that they, he never used names. And so for him to say Abraham a rich man, Lazarus, like it's very detailed. And so it's interesting though, because Enoch and Elijah didn't die. So I don't know. I never thought about them just being up in heaven <laughs> before. Like they're just the only two human beings up there. Everyone else is even Abraham and David are in paradise or whatever it was called. Sheol. Was it Sheol or was that another name? I can't remember. But yeah, it's just, it's interesting. Never thought about that. It's also interesting because when you really think about it, um, Elijah in the Old Testament and then Elijah in the New Testament is John the Baptist. But Elijah ascends to heaven after his ministry, but John the Baptist is martyred. And then, so you have that parallel. Then you have the parallel of Elisha and Jesus because Elisha... Um, performs the most mir is performs the second most miracles in the Bible. He performs the most miracles in the Old Testament. But the most I mean, and then Jesus performs the most miracles in the Bible. So you kind of have that parallel of um Elijah and John the Baptist and then Elisha and Jesus. And then again, Elisha he passes, but um he's not martyred. And then Jesus is crucified obviously. So I always thought that was interesting cuz Elijah and Elisha weren't martyred or crucified or not crucified or killed. Even though they stood up to very, very evil kings, like you would have thought they would have died, but they never did. And then John the Baptist and Jesus both had to die. I mean, obviously Jesus had to die, but John the Baptist being killed too was, I don't know, it's just interesting. Describes everyone from the Old Testament being in like this massive huddle and just kind of <laughs> shimmying around as they talk to Enoch and Elijah. And there's a really cool thing that's mentioned. So in the Bible, it says that whenever Jesus was crucified. It's a cool thought. Like I've had these thoughts before. Like what was, like you try to imagine what was going on when Jesus, you know, resurrected and what Abraham and all that stuff was going on or Elijah and Enoch and how everybody were acting. Like it's, I've had those thoughts too. There were two people being crucified on either side of him. Both of them are just simply known as the thieves in the Gospels. One of them mocked Jesus and made fun of him, and the other one asked to be saved. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. So as all of them are standing there in heaven, the first soul walks through the gates, and it's a man carrying a cross on his back. And they ask, who are you? And he says, I was the thief who died alongside Christ. And as Jesus met me, as my soul was leaving my body, he told me to show them the cross, and that's all I needed to get in the gates. And also, apparently, Charinus and Lentheus witnessed all of this and then relayed it to Pilate, 
And then it says that the next day, Pilate went to the temple to the Pharisees who persecuted Jesus and was like, hey, is that Jesus guy the real deal? And they open up the records and read them and are like, oh, yeah. Turns out that was God we killed. <laughs> Whoops. The acts of Pilate was found in Pilate's records. And according to the text at the end, it was dated to the 19th year of the reign of Tiberius, which lines up for the time this would have happened. And we know that the combination of the Gospel of Nicodemus and the Acts of Pilate were passed around a lot in the early days of the church. Now, if it was being passed around as a piece of true teaching, or as just a piece of poetry, who knows? None of the early church members really make mention of it, and it's never defined as an exonerated divine word of God, like several of the other books of the New Testament are. This is where early church history gets uh, complicated. Because there's a lot of works where you're like, is this true? Is it not? Like like I said, I've met people who like put so much emphasis on early church leaders. And for me, I put a lot of emphasis on the Bible. And for, But for some, that's a controversial thing. Like they put more emphasis on what they believe. Like it could, I mean, it could be a mix. Like it could be poetry and it could be historical, like the Gospel of Nicodemus. Like, there could be truth in this, or and it could also be poetry. Like, this is true, and this is not, and it could, it could just be a mix, and that's why it's not in the Bible, because it's just, it's cloudy. And then, but, yeah, there's just, again, if you don't know Scripture, if you don't know the truth, I think it's, Hebrews is a really good book. Like, if you've ever, because it's written to Jewish people who come out of that but even as like a gentile like you read hebrews and it i feel like it perfectly articulates who jesus is who god is because it perfectly ties into the old testament it's constantly referencing what old testament scripture said and what it meant and what it's alluding to like it perfectly paints it for them because they were struggling with that and so it perfectly says okay you know this is you're struggling with this here's what this says here's what this says here's what this is says here's what the holy spirit said here's what this says. it's so it's constantly pointing them back to scripture it's not like talking on his own turn it's talking about scripture they had read in the synagogue before and so i mean and there's always works like this like the gospel of nicodemus where you can get like it sounds really good but there might be a few things off and there's a lot of things that sound really good but if you don't really test it then it can lead you astray and the same thing with Acts of Pilate like there, there could be truth in it like it's not like blasphemous like there could be some truth but again like it could be truth it could be poetry it's like uh, you know it, but you just I don't know I think scripture emphasizes testing everything not just blindly believing whatever somebody says to you and not blindly believing what other preacher tells you like fact check your preacher fact check your Sunday school teacher fact check you know the musician fact check everybody like think for yourself with scripture fact check it the scripture always go back to scripture don't try to just go off man because man will always lead you astray and again I am not thinking less of it because of the idea that Christ raised souls out of hell that is a belief that's held by a lot of different denominations and groups <laughs> And there is a brief mention in 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19 that people think means Jesus went to For Christ has also suffered once, suffered for sins, the just, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by spirit, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in person. Yeah, that's... Yeah, there's that verse. That's a little tricky. Because I've heard... Things that make sense, things that don't make sense, and then things that are really out there. <laughs> uh, that's just the truth of being in a church. Like, you go to church for a while, you're going to hear things that make sense, things that don't make sense, and then things where you're like, where did you get that? How did you come to that conclusion? But To hell and raise the souls. So again, not discrediting for that. But if we're talking about it from a logistic standpoint, or a logical standpoint, I should say, I don't think these two had the accounts that they mentioned. I don't think a lot of the um, the the, the dialogue's definitely moments, wrong. 
<laughs> like <laughs> the first soul entering into heaven and everyone like waving and smiling or uh, Pilate going to the people who killed Jesus and then being like, ah, he is the son of God. Why didn't I think of that? Um, while very pretty, I treat this in the same way I do the Divine Comedy, that I don't think it is a true story by any means. It's just an interesting piece of poetry that I think you can glean something out of. But you know what Divine Comedy is? Fan fiction, just like the Acts of Pilate. You know, I was going to skip around, but after doing the infancy streak... I agree with that. I would probably put this one in fanfic too. I mean, it's just... Historical to me is like you can kind of like point to some evidence of it being true but i understand where he's going with that like uh i don't know like there's some kind of like you can fact check it like there's some truth to it but i don't know it's just it could it could be true but i feel like a lot of these end up being fan fiction like i feel like 90 percent of probably canon works didn't make the Bible, like the lost books of the Bible, probably are in these two categories, objectively. I think they either try to figure out how to word this. They try to add on details that aren't there, that aren't really important, that the Bible doesn't put in, that the apostles didn't put in because they didn't find them important. But us being humans, we try to add on and like make prequels and sequels and we try to just like add in all these characters and details and then it's just it's but it's fan fiction and then there's just outright you know first gospel of the infancy of christ <laughs> it's just straight up blasphemy um where they're trying to like create their own theology or they're trying to make fun of it which i feel like is what the first gospel was trying to do but i don't know historical for me is like you can like, there's some piece of evidence that you can point to that's like, oh, this is somewhat true. Or, like, there's a... You can fact check it, is what I'm trying to say. But if you can't, then it's fact fiction for me. Fan fiction for me. Right through, and after starting The Passion, it would probably be really confusing, or, you know, more confusing than it's already going to be, to, like, jump from passion narratives to letters to infancy and whatever... So I'll just stick and run through the passions, which means our next one is the Gospel of Peter. The Gospel of Peter is fascinating from a historical standpoint. We see several letters from early church fathers that will mention things like the Gospels of Perfection or the Holy Gospel of Antioch or what have you that have been completely lost to time. They've just disappeared off the face of the earth because they weren't as well preserved as several as these were and especially not as much as the Bible. So we found several early letters that talked about the Gospel of Peter. And again, it was just assumed to be one of those books that have been lost to time. Until in 1886, when a French survey crew was doing an expedition in Akmem, Egypt, and found a transcript called the Gospel of Peter buried in the tomb of a 9th century monk. Which the implications of that in itself are wild. <laughs> but the fact that this thing was just considered lost and then a tomb was opened and a piece of paper that isn't believed to be the original because this one, like I said, was written in the 9th century, it seems. It seems that it was even potentially transcribed by the monk himself. But it is a copy of a gospel that was apparently lost forever. And the gospel was not complete, and a lot of it had been weathered and eroded by time. However, it was a definitive piece of what was once believed to be at least known by the early members of the church. The section we do have is a retelling of the crucifixion that for the most part goes right in line with the other narratives of the gospels. However, there's a few little mentions that I really like. So it says in the Bible that whenever Jesus died on the cross that there was a great earthquake and a large storm and the sun blacked out and all of that for several hours. And in the Gospel of Peter, it says that the reason that happened was that whenever they were removing Jesus from the cross and the bloody nails were pulled out that had the blood of the sinless Lamb of God and they were dropped to the earth, that whenever the nail hit the earth, 
the earth cried out in agony. <laughs> this gospel also slightly gives levity to Pilate. If you, um, I don't know. I mean, there's a video a guy made. Well, I mean, obviously. Uh, there was a, he did like research. He was a lawyer and he did research on the Star of Bethlehem. And I don't know. People have praised it and people have criticized it either for a lot of different reasons, but if you watch it, it's the Star of Bethlehem. It's called the Star of Bethlehem, I think. Uh, and it's about, basically he uses technology to go back in time when Jesus died, or when Jesus was born. And it shows you all what the stars were doing, and then it shows you what the stars were doing when he died. And so it's just, it's really fascinating. If, you know, I don't know, I feel like it's pretty true. It seems like it's a pretty accurate account. And then, I mean, obviously... God being all knowing because the stars are all pre calculated that he already had all of that when he created the the whole world he already had that set up because when Jesus dies at three o'clock it's like the moon immediately goes into an eclipse a blood moon like immediately and then it's just it's it's really cool it's interesting like a lot of Christians avoid science I feel like but there's a lot there to study like there's just so much there because God is awesome and so he, it's. I think he wants us to study it. And again, I don't know what uh, some of the criticisms are. I think some of it is he plagiarized a little bit. I don't know. I've only heard bits and pieces, but I don't think pe too many people have actually criticized what he found. It's just how he found it, and he's kind of taking credit for it. I think that's one of the things, but I've never – I should probably fact check this. <laughs> I'm over here being like, you should fact check, fact check scripture, and I'm just over here like, I don't know, maybe he plagiarized, I don't know. It was a good video, though. <laughs> it was interesting. Like I said earlier, it's heavily debated if Pilate is responsible for the crucifixion or not, or at least if he's responsible in a spiritual sense. There's also, um, when, he's cru when Jesus is being crucified, he puts uh, the king of the Jews and then the Pharisees and such. He's like, can you take that down? He's like, no. So I don't know. It's very half-hearted. I don't know. It's like he's half-heartedly trying to do the right thing. And I'm also trying to... I feel like I heard something once. And it was interesting. I feel like with Rome, they had like three strikes. Like a guy like Pilate with Rome. And Pilate was on like his second strike. Or no. He had two strikes. Because, I mean, the Romans and the Jews were constantly going back and forth. So, with Jesus, it was like... Pilate wanted to do the right thing, but if a riot broke out, then he would get his third strike and probably get killed himself. So again, it's like, it's very murky. It's like he tries to do the right thing, but then he ends up fighting for Pilate himself at the end, instead of doing the right thing. And this gospel kind of gives him alleviation, because it says that Pilate wasn't the one who wanted Jesus dead. Instead, Herod demanded that Pilate kill Jesus. This isn't the Herod who tried to kill Jesus as the baby that everyone knows from the book of Luke. This is his son, also named Herod. The only other mentions that deviate from the Bible is it says the reason Joseph of Arimathea was able to convince Pilate to take Christ's body is because Joseph and Pilate were friends, which would make sense because Joseph, as mentioned earlier, was like a high-ranking member in Jerusalem society. So it seems that it was kind of a friend favor that allowed him to take the body of Christ. And it says that during the storm and earthquake, it was so dark that people had to hold lanterns and kept running into each other. And again, no way to verify if this was written by Peter. My guess would be no, because for one, Peter was the head of the early church. So if he wrote a gospel like this, I imagine they would have preserved it. It was probably written by someone years later, again, pretending to be Peter, or at least speaking, speaking from the potential perspective of Peter. But it seems to be another transcript of the crucifixion, and the fact it was found in the condition it was is incredible and gives a lot of ideas to how the scriptures, or believed to be scriptures, move throughout history. So I think it's very cool, and we're calling it historical. Next up, we have the narrative. That's fair. I think I would put that one historical, too. Um... I think it is getting a bit late here. It's 2.03 in the morning and I'm filming. 
Um, I'm really enjoying these. Learning a lot. Um, but I think I'm going to call it there for the day. Um, so thank you so much for watching. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think. And uh, if there's any other videos you'd like me to review. Like Bible-related videos. I, I, I love... I mean, obviously, I'm a pastor, so... I'm all about talking the Bible. I really enjoying this series. I know he has other videos on, you know, Christian things. So I'm, I might look at those too. So, but anyway, uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, don't, if you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe and, uh, I will see you guys tomorrow. Hope you guys have a great Saturday.